Hi everybody and welcome to today's Art of Procurement. I'm your host, Philip Heidson. So you've just been appointed to a new CPO position. Your executive leadership team is looking at you to make an immediate impact while setting up procurement as a driver of sustainable long-term value. Your first 100 days, they can make or break your career. But where do you start? Today is day three of a special five-part series. It's brought to you in partnership with Officio, the world's largest procurement consultancy firm. This series provides you with the roadmap you need to hit the ground running. And in this episode, I spoke with Sushank Agarwal to discuss the tactics that achieve the delicate balance of achieving quick wins through in-year savings, while not immediately creating adversarial relationships across the stakeholder and supplier population. Sushank has over 17 years experience advising C-suite level clients in global companies on strategic cost reduction and procurement transformation across a range of different sectors. And I started by asking Sushank if pushing for quick win savings always means that you're going to start off with an unhappy supply base. Yeah, that's uh, that's quite an interesting uh, point, Phil. Uh, in more than 80% of the time when there's a new CPO that uh, takes a role, there's some sort of an urgency of benefits delivery. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that rigor is required, and um, the previous management teams not be able to push that uh, level of rigor or have those skill sets because uh, sometimes the leads get com- uh, complacent and it's uh, it's harder to get into that uh, faster pace environment. So the new CPO, it's typically the impact, the, mo- the biggest tangible impact they can make normally in the first few weeks, essentially by um, showcasing what they can deliver, tangible value they can deliver into the team, uh, especially when there's a, uh, there's a business priority, number one, to deliver the in-year benefits, to yeah. maximize the in-year benefits. So it gets harder for the new CPO to land, but then if they have got the right skill set, the right approach and the right mindset, it's uh, it's it's a way to showcase that uh, they have got that caliber, that uh, that uh, tangible impact that they can make uh, very quickly into the business, uh, which is sustainable as well. Mm-hmm. And I think that earns them a lot of respect pretty quickly within the business because uh, that's generally the hardest thing for a new CPO to have respect from uh, or to gain that credibility yeah. from the business and the senior business leads and this is a this is a really good way even if there's no in year urgency or very low in year urgency from a savings perspective it's uh, it's it's a no brainer for a number of CPOs to do so given that quick win savings are really important for new CPO you know when you start to go down the line of creating a quick win savings program does that always mean you're going to end up with unhappy suppliers at the end of it? That's quite interesting you ask, uh, Phil, because um, I'm actually seeing completely reverse mm-hmm. of clients who've uh, effectively uh, deployed um, quick win savings. And uh, the way I see most of the successful uh, procurement teams drive it forward is through collaboration with the mm-hmm. suppliers where there's... Um, optimizing demand requirements, shaping, making sure there's a win-win situation on both sides from a quick impact perspective. I had a client, for example, last year who were looking at buying certain licenses, software licenses, and they were spending so much money on software licenses. And a quick win for them traditionally would have been just go in and ask for a rate reduction or the license fee reduction cost. Uh, by the way, they, they, they didn't even consider that they could actually, they were buying way too many licenses, right. so they're not buying at the right levels. So trying to optimize demand and requirements is typically the way where the suppliers are able to reduce their costs and they're able to pass those benefits into the clients. And that's where we see majority of the value coming from. Mm-hmm. Um, and We've also seen um, suppliers actually talking to the procurement teams and telling them that there's value to be had. And over the years, procurement teams haven't really uh, been serious about those points or been uh, pushy enough to push those uh, demand or optimizing the demand side, uh, take, taken that seriously. And I think this is uh, kind of a no-brainer for, for the procurement teams to go for in collaboration with the suppliers. The instances where we do see suppliers unhappy or not uh, really pleased with the with the approaches, typically where they've been overcharging uh, over the 
a huge number of years, mm-hmm. whether this, the rates or costs are not aligned to the market benchmarks. And that's when they have to come into the real world and go into the real prices. And by that time, they've got huge overheads, which need to be uh, optimized in line with the market. But overall, what we typically see is um, it's a win-win situation in majority of the cases when uh, when procurement teams go out and and uh, run this effectively. Mm-hmm. Now, um, I'm sure that some of those suppliers, you said, the ones that are unhappy is because there's also that reputational risk for them of the fact that they realize that they've perhaps been um, a little bit rich in their margins and now they're going to get found out. Yeah, yeah, there is uh, there is a bit of that, and uh, nobody's nobody's pleased when yeah. suddenly their margins are slashed <laughs> down, uh, even though that's what their peers have, have been earning at. So uh, it's uh, it's how you optimize your cost to make mm-hmm. sure your business is still effective, because um, the idea of, of this is not to get suppliers go down under and right. uh, not make any margin right. at all, because that won't be sustainable at all. Um, so we're looking at where the leading procurement teams are actually wanting to work with the suppliers to make sure they make a sensible margin out of it because they are running a business at the end of the day. Um, but they're optimizing the requirements and pushing the best value out of the clients. Mm-hmm. Now, when you're looking for um, quick win savings opportunities, you know there's always this trade-off between going for some short-term savings today versus perhaps the risk of uh, losing value over the long term. And I just wonder how you kind of look at that trade-off. Yeah, I think uh, that's, a, that's a really interesting dilemma. Um, and most of my clients, this is almost the, the first or one of the initial points of discussion that we get into. Uh, and it all depends, really, the urgency of uh, why they need those savings and how much is the urgency for, for, for the numbers to come in. I mean, I think uh, simply put, in financial terms, it's the the way I see it. It's the time value for money. So mm-hmm. you could get one million savings today, or you could get two million savings in two years' time. Um, but depending upon what the cost of capital is and yeah. what's the urgency to deliver those benefits, that one million today might be worth a lot more than two million in two years. So it all depends what the priorities are in the business, and I think those are the those are the decisions that need to be made based on facts um, and, and and the right category analysis. Mm-hmm. There is a there is a balance, uh, and I've seen clients where uh, there is an urgency and they need money this year, yeah. but they don't want to lock in for the long term. So. I've seen uh, where some of the contracts are coming up for renewals and uh, the incumbent suppliers are able to, with some some collaborative discussions, are able to offer a certain amount of discount uh, for extension by a year. Mm-hmm. That just enables the – it's a minimum situation again because the suppliers get surety of, uh, of that contract for another year while um, the clients get uh, some some value this year, which they're desperate for, rather than spending a lot of time and effort to go out of the market this year itself and yeah. limit their in-year number because of that. So, so, so shorter extension is generally, generally something that some of the clients look at. Yeah, and that allows you then to time the market better, especially when you're looking in a situation where you have multiple providers in a particular category or for a particular product. So then lining up all the expiration dates um, for a yeah. probably a, a bigger initiative down the line, a more strategic initiative down the line. Absolutely right. Absolutely right, Phil. I think um, this is uh, this is uh, there's a variety of factors which we play in in terms of how long do you want that contract to be. So if the market's doing uh, the right trend, so for for example, in some of the categories, spend categories where. Uh, there's a huge influence on commodity prices. Um, you have to look into the future trends and base your decisions on that. So you might might uh, want to lock in the uh, prices for longer term in that instance mm-hmm. if you're seeing the price is going to go uh, up north over the next uh, few years. Uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's a balancing act, and you have to account for all of those factors yeah. so, uh, accordingly. So when you are... Um when you're chasing these quick savings, you know, it's, and it's something that I think a lot of procurement executives do when they're in a role, obviously to make an impact. Um, what are some of the pitfalls that you see in the pursuit of those savings? 
Yeah, there's um, it's, a, it's a really good question, and um, and there's a, there's quite a few that we normally see, and, um, and unfortunately, there's uh, there's a lot of a lot of the uh, efforts that go in from an in-year quick savings perspective are regarded as tactical, mm-hmm. and a lot of the procurement teams go for tactical supply discounts by sending out letters to yes. all the suppliers for yeah. a certain number of discounts, and it's got a hit and miss, in my opinion, what, what I've seen in the number of clients sometimes you get, but then it's uh, it, it, it's not really sustainable because the supplies then account for those prices right. next time round, mm-hmm. uh, the discounts that you offer. But there's two or three things that we normally see um, where the key pitfalls from a client's perspective. One is uh, where the teams decide to go based on opinion. So uh, they feel that a particular supplier or a particular market or a particular category has got a lot of lot of margin in it, and therefore they should be going after that mm-hmm. rather than a fact based approach with the right treatment strategy. So I think um, there's an absolute need to do the right analytics, the right benchmarking to make sure you're not following a opinion based agenda. It's a fact based agenda, yeah. and you identify the right opportunity based on based on true facts and what the market's doing and how the benchmarks say. So that's that's I think number one. Number two, uh, in my opinion, is uh, more on the engagement with the stakeholders. So although procurement teams might be really sharp in terms of understanding the market and the key categories, um, one thing they they sometimes miss on is this uh, engagement with the key business stakeholders. So the CIO, COO, or CFO. In, in terms of making sure um, they bring the key stakeholders with them when they are shaping that uh, that RFP mm-hmm. or reaching out to the market, because um, they sometimes those disconnects are not very evident at the start of the process, but as you're coming closer to a contract award, there's a, there's a big mismatch between what a CIA would want mm-hmm. uh, uh, in terms of what the supplier to do versus what's the supplier thinks they are bidding for. So I, I can't really emphasize enough the importance of that, especially in an in-year savings environment where um, you, you things run much faster or have to run much faster because every single day's delay is costing the business a huge amount right. of money. And then the third key thing is just in terms of just rigor, uh, program management rigor, decisions being taken on time. You almost need to run this at a drumbeat uh, because every single day is costing you money. And you need to be pretty clear in terms of savings tracking as well. So if you say you've you've um, ended up saving $5 million, which is going to have a $3 million in year impact, you need to be able to showcase that through till the end of the year so that mm-hmm. uh, for a CFO, for a, for a finance director, able to recognize and see those numbers coming through so in my in my mind those are the three key things which are which are absolute essential uh, to to be successful in a quick savings program and just to touch on savings tracking because i know that's something that's um it's so important as you mentioned and something that we don't necessarily always focus on um mm. i wonder if you could you know, like the organizations that you see doing that well, do they have a, a governance structure around savings? So, for example, getting buy into methodologies upfront and throughout the entire project with finance so that finance can validate at the end. Do you see that as being pretty common or um, is, is that yeah, something? Yeah, that, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, Phil. I think um, it's not just the methodology part from a savings methodology at the very start. We see um, almost a weekly, uh, once a week or even twice mm-hmm. a week I've seen where they say constant reconciliation with the finance team to say these projects have finished off this week and here's the numbers, how they're going to be recognized and be tracked so that there's a, there's a seamless uh, transfer of that uh, knowledge into the finance team and they're aware that if this contract is going to kick off uh, from from next week at the reduced prices or the discount rates, they can see those rebates or they can see those discounts being applied to the invoices from next week onwards. So this is absolutely crucial. So I think a lot of the, the basics are done well by most of the procurement teams by getting the right methodology, but they leave it, they just throw it over the fence sometimes mm-hmm. and uh, with, with an assumption that the finance team is going to be able to pick that up. And that tracking from a savings benefit doesn't 
isn't fully effective, and the suppliers see see that through, and uh, those savings start to dilute uh, if that happens. So, absolutely, as you said, uh, finance integrated together with procurement is absolutely essential to do this. Hi there. I want to thank you for listening into today's podcast as part of our series that helps you take the actions that you need in your first hundred days to position procurement for long term success. If you'd like to get more insight into how to approach your first hundred days or to reference all the tips that are covered in this series, Officio has created a handy downloadable checklist. It's really easy to grab your copy of this checklist. All you need to do is go to artofprocurement.com slash 100 days. That's artofprocurement.com slash 100 days.